Welcome everybody to the latest SPF UK Climate Resilience Programme webinar. Um, today we've got a focus on COP26. Um, COP26, as many of you will have seen in the news or through your professional roles, is a major international climate conference um, that will be taking place in Scotland in November. And it's at these events where nations from around the world come to talk about responding to the challenges of climate change. Next slide, please. We've got three really good speakers today, and they're gonna give us um, a range of perspectives. So I, I've tended to think about this when we put the event together as the international scale, the national scale, and then the more local scale. Um, so each of our speakers has been selected um, because they come from one of those particular backgrounds. Um, we have Youssef Nassef from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and he'll tell us about the process and the international aspects in particular. Liam Upson from the Cabinet Office will focus on some of the UK aims, and Louise Ellis from the University of Leeds will talk about what it means on a UK university scale and give some practical examples. Um, it'll be great really to see how those scales interact. Before we begin with those, if we could just go through the usual house rules. So how to engage, we'll have the presentations first. Um, today, actually, for those who join on a regular basis, we have fewer slides than usual. So we'll be hearing the opinions of the, the speakers uh, without the distraction of slides in, in many of the cases. Um, after we've had all three of the talks, we'll go into the Q&A and the discussion and you should be able to enter your questions into the Q&A box at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, often people ask similar questions, so have a look what people have asked and upvote your favourites. Um, in some cases, we may unmute uh, the person asking the question uh, and bring them into the discussion if, uh, if that looks like it's going to be helpful. Uh, we will record the event, so the audio and the few slides we have will be shared after the event. And if you have technical problems, please use the chat function and Simon uh, will help pick that up. As usual, also, please feel free to tweet on what you're hearing or you're thinking about that. And at the bottom is a link to our website. We're constantly adding uh, new content to that. So it's well worth a, a repeat visit. Next slide, please. Um, we also have program news. Uh, so this time, the first item, um, several of you will remember one of the, uh, the SPF Climate Resilience programmes, Cruise UK, looking at the wine sector um, in the UK and understanding how climate variability and change uh, will impact. Um, they produced a new video. There's a link to that at the bottom. Please do go and check that out. Uh, it's a it's really, really good way, I think, of communicating the findings. Next slide, please. Um, one of the really, um, really successful aspects of the programme so far is the idea of embedded researchers, placing researchers into organisations that are actively dealing with the challenge of climate change. And you can see on the bottom right there a list of the first round um, of organisations that took part and that took an embedded researcher. Um, there's now another round, and so applications are invited. The closing date is on the 21st of May. More details on the Climate Resilience website, and the link is at the bottom. Next slide, please. In this year of COP, there are also quite a number of conference events. So our event today is actually part of a, a week-long event um, at the University of, of Leeds. Um, shortly, there'll be a conference that's organised by the UK Met Office that will be on the 11th and 12th um, of May. Please consider registering. Also, the poster deadline has been extended, so there's still just about time if you want to get a, a poster into that conference. Next slide, please. And finally, we wanted to highlight um, another project that is developing a national centre um, looking at um, uh, greening 
the finance and investment industry, working really closely between academia and industry. Um, from the SPF Climate Resilience Programme, we've already made contact um, with this new programme. We see some uh, really interesting overlaps in terms of data sets and tools. Um, I'm also pleased to be involved with the, the new programme and we'll hear more about that um, as it progresses. We'll have a speaker uh, from that probably at the end of the, the summer. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so without any further delay, we're now going to move on to the three speakers and starting with uh, Youssef. Youssef, please. Thank you very much, Jason. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to, um, to have been invited to, um, to this meeting. Um, the, the way I'll, I'll, I'll go about this is to um, focus on three things. One is a quick evolution of um, the adaptation discourse in the international policy sphere in the UNFCCC, um, followed by the current setup and then um, some uh, overview of what will happen in Glasgow, as this is probably of, of great interest to, to this audience. So I've, I've been involved in adaptation since um, uh, the 90s, um, saw the, the birth of many of the international institutions that, that were involved in it. I even uh, served as a midwife for some of, of these births. And, um, uh, I, I see us having moved through three stages. One is uh, a stage of deconstruction, deconstruction of an initial setup that was not conducive um, to effective adaptation policy, followed by a reconstruction, creating the right environment, the right enabling environment, followed by a subsequent scaling up and a more holistic approach to, um, to adaptation in the process. So let me take them one by one. In the initial days, um, the, I would say we started from below zero because uh, the setting was characterized by, by four um, um, attributes that made it difficult to, to advance an adaptation. One, in the climate change process, the, the financial mechanism did not really cater to adaptation because it was operated by the Global Environment Facility, which uh, which was premised on the principle of incremental cost for global benefits. And hence, it was more skewed towards mitigation projects that then helped um, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And adaptation was sort of the little uh, sibling there. I mean, there were enabling activities to help with assessments. Uh, there was once a pilot called the Strategic Priority on Adaptation, a small amount of money to see how it would work. But still, predominantly, the money uh, interna internationally went to mitigation. Second issue, more of a scientific nature, was uh, the notion of attribution. Back then, the general discourse was that, you know what, we need to wait for some certainty so you can associate specific impacts with climate change. So you can say, hey, half of my hurricane this year was due to climate change and the other half wasn't, and hence there's an international responsibility there. So that was still there in, in the early uh, days uh, of, of our negotiations. Third was the link to response measures. And Suraj knows the story very well because he was uh, very much involved in, uh, in, in that, where the discussions on adaptation were always linked to the discussions of any impacts of mitigation policy, especially on oil producers and exporters. They are in the same, uh, in the same uh, paragraph in the convention, paragraph 4.8. So there was the adverse effects part and there was the part on impact of implementation of response measures. So they always had to move in a balanced way and that's loaded down considerably. And finally, there was a generally weaker legitimacy for adaptation than mitigation, which is best exemplified by a quote from Al Gore in his book, Earth in the Balance, where he said adaptation represents a kind of laziness, an arrogant faith in our ability to react in time to save our skins. Now he was not alone in saying that back in 92 and it took uh, more than 10 years to migrate towards seeing adaptation as another legitimate response to climate change. But the, the idea was that we need to, um, to solve the problem 
and not give up and start to adapt to it. That was what was going on in people's minds. Eventually, all of this changed. Then now I go to the reconstruction phase where um, things changed a bit because the IPCC eventually told us that you know you will not reach a phase where you can uh, attribute with certainty anything that's happening to climate change um, and that was uh, accepted in the process uh, and the third assessment report um, chapter 18 in particular started to conceptualize a framework for how to think of adaptation and so that fed into our process and that period between um, 2001 and 2010, so between COP7 and COP16, I measure, I measure my life in COP numbers. Other people measure them in calendar years. Um, that, that was a period when we started building the enabling environment. So COP7 created the first adaptation regime with funds, the LDC fund, the Special Climate Change Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and a process for LDCs to identify their urgent and immediate needs called NAPAS, National Adaptation Programs of Action. And that started uh, the sort of pushing, accelerating the move towards more implementation of adaptation, especially in developing countries. A bit later, we created this knowledge hub and stakeholder engagement hub, uh, knowing that we need all actors to come on board, not just a few players, the UNFCC and the GEF and the implementing agencies, so the Nairobi work program was created, which has over 400 partners now, which are organizations aligned to supporting adaptation technically um, and, and moving ahead the, the, the methodologies. Um, and so that was that reconstruction phase where things started moving um, ahead. A lot of awareness was created for adaptation and calls for parity with mitigation moved um, very quickly. Third phase since 2010 is that of scaling up. So we, we had that setup that was there, and then we got to the second adaptation regime where scaling up um, became not just more of the same, but we realized that as you move towards national policy and, 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 and uh, a more integrated way to look at adaptation, uh, new types of mechanisms were needed. So the Cancun adaptation framework um, in COP16, 2010, produced that framework with a, a setup for national adaptation plans, which look at medium and long-term adaptation planning and a mechanism for loss and damage, which is basically how to support uh, those impacts, those losses that have not been addressed through planned adaptation or through uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then because of the multiplicity of players and the multiplicity of funds and mechanisms, an adaptation committee was created to uh, inject overall coherence and to provide um, uh, strategic advice to the parties on adaptation. So that was the scaling up phase, which entailed a move towards holism, towards comprehensiveness, uh, together with the creation of the Green Climate Fund and the identification of a mobilization uh, goal for finance of 100 billion, of which it was intended to be distributed equally equitably between adaptation and mitigation. And um, following that, of course, the, the, the Paris Agreement came, gave a slight push forward for adaptation, uh, consolidated the existing um, um, modalities, and here we are. I mean, today one can say that uh, we've gone such a long way, first in terms of recognition of the importance of adaptation as a legitimate response to climate change, which we, we just um, see as normal, but uh, a couple of decades ago, it was not seen as such. And the existence of an enabling environment and a holistic setup that can support if uh, the, the financial, technological, and capacity building support is there, which, which it is, of course, in need of further um, enhancement. Now, um, in terms of the current setup, like I said, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see um, the national adaptation plans on the one hand and the loss and damage mechanism on the other. So conceptually, this is important for, um, for, 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 for looking at them in a complementary way. Uh, I mean, imagine a, um, uh, an extreme event happening 
there are things you can do before to reduce disasters and that uh, sort of mirrors the types of activities that are normally supported through development cooperation. And then there are things that can happen afterwards, which are normally the purview of the humanitarian world, um, uh, rehabilitation, et cetera. And I feel the loss and damage uh, uh, narrative is part of that. How do you respond after that? Now it has been framed in a way that it, it's, a, it's a result of a failure of adaptation. But perhaps there's also an, an optimal there. Maybe some things are best done uh, preemptively, some things are best done uh, reactively using insurance, for example. Um, and, and so methodologies for, for that optimization, actually uh, we're working on that and I'm, I'm happy to share some of these if anyone's interested. Um, so we have that two, uh, those two sets of, of mechanisms that are complementary. We have the knowledge platform, we have the stakeholder engagement platform, the Nairobi Work Program. We have uh, four constituted bodies to help with NAPS, with uh, loss and damage, and specifically for indigenous peoples, support for indigenous peoples and knowledge of indigenous peoples that's there as well. And then we have a new Paris stream, which is intended to support um, the, the assessment of progress. So the global stock take, which happens once every five years, the first of which will be in 2023. And, um, and, and th there's an instrument there called adaptation communications, uh, which feeds into an adaptation registry where, as you know, the nationally determined contributions feed into a mitigation registry and both uh, are core pillars of information for the global stock take. So coming on to, to, to Glasgow, um, one would, uh, would say that in a COP, success is not just determined by the outcomes of the negotiations. That used to be the case many years ago. Now, um, there are things that feed into the COP session, initiatives, declarations, et cetera, that are not necessarily part of agenda items. So part of what will happen on adaptation will be um, uh, 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 coming out of, of the agenda items and part not. So in terms of the negotiations themselves, um, we have a, a stream for addressing gaps in national adaptation plans, which are mandated to be discussed in the next COP. And we have um, a sort of a leftover discussion on governance for the loss and damage mechanism for the Warsaw International Mechanism, where there's an issue of whether it only um, is accountable to the, the Paris Agreement regime or also to the convention regime. There is a review of the adaptation fund happening in Glasgow. And um, there is a discussion that will be on the global goal on adaptation, which is defined by Article 7 of the Paris Agreement. And the adaptation committee is working on uh, presenting some methodological work on that, which is also important for the global stock take, because we know for mitigation, it's easy to reflect progress in terms of one number, whether that number is a size of emissions or uh, a warming level or a concentration level parts per million. Adaptation is a bit more complex and no one has yet cracked um, uh, that problem because um, we have not ever found one metric that can encapsulate progress on adaptation. And yet we need to do so in the global stock take, find an acceptable way of, of reflecting progress so that the international community can be able to give itself that report card of, yes, we're doing well on this and, and keep going ahead, or no, we're not doing well on this, we're far um, from the goal. In terms of outside the negotiations, the eyes of the world, as has been in Madrid, is on ambition, looking for signals to show that the, the work has taken seriously, the signals from the science, both in the 1.5 report from the IPCC or from the IBIS report on biodiversity, knowing that we have a few years that we need to exhibit scaling up of action, both for mitigation and for adaptation. So something um, like that would have to be reflected either in what we call decision number one out of um, the, the conference, which usually has these top level issues of ambition um, and uh, coupled with signals on finance. And you're hearing a lot from, um, uh, from, from um, uh, countries nowadays uh, saying that this uh, should be a high priority in this COP 
ensuring that the 100 billion has materialized, looking ahead to a ramp up because there is a start of negotiations on ramping up to a new level by 2025. And these negotiations will start in Glasgow. Depends on whether they go positively or negatively, how, how we will, we will uh, be able to, um, to assess progress on that one. But um, in the end, we're optimistic. There's a lot of reasons um, to be happy with progress so far on adaptation, especially when you see it historically all the way from, uh, from 95 till today. But there's also a lot still that needs to happen. Um, a lot of support, both on the supply side and a lot of work at the demand side in terms of um, assessment and properly articulating um, um, the, 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 the nature of the threat at the national and subnational level as well in order to create the absorptive capacity for that support. So with this, I will uh, stop. I think I've, I've already fulfilled my, my time quota. And back to you, Jason. Thank you, Youssef. That was an excellent coverage of the, the international issues. And I think it really reminds us of that, that shift from COP, just focusing on mitigation to increasingly um, giving a, a, an equal voice to mitigation and to resilience issues, which I think are, are particularly interesting to, to this group. So thank you very much for that. Uh, next up, we have Liam. Uh, Liam, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jason. And hello, everyone. Um, it is a real privilege to be participating in this event. Events and thank you to the organisers, UKRI and the University of Leeds. So I've been asked to speak on the UK presidency approach to adaptation at COP26. Much of this parallels with what Youssef was mentioning in, by way of kind of negotiating outcomes. And this is what the UK kind of presidency is doing uh, to support those negotiating outcomes. So, so the real headline is that we all know that the impacts of climate change are happening now and our response cannot wait. Um, even if we stopped emissions, rising as of today, the world would still need to deal with significant climate disruption. So practical action is urgently required um, to minimize and avert and address loss and damage, but to scale up and accelerate adaptation action as well. And investing in adaptation makes good business sense. Um, so the net benefits can be measured in trillions of dollars and these far outweigh the costs. There's much evidence for this from the kind of global center on adaptation, but also domestically as well through our own kind of climate change risk assessments. And under the COP26 presidency, the UK has made adaptation and loss and damage a priority. Um, it's one of the four goals in which Alok Sharma will speak to. And we really want to raise the profile of adaptation. So amplify the need for everyone in developed and developing countries alike to take action to prepare for current and future climate risks. So the campaign itself is bringing together governments, uh, civil society, business and people from around the world to mobilize greater action to prepare for and manage these risks. Um, and in significantly increasing adaptation financing, fundamentally to deliver for those most vulnerable and marginalized. So women and girls, indigenous peoples, young people, etc. And we want to build on the momentum of initiatives before. Uh, so the UNSG in 2019 at the UN Climate Action Summit, there was a, a launch of a call for action. And much of the campaign builds upon that. So the campaign is three intersecting pillars, uh, plan, act, and finance. The next slide, please. And these pillars are very much complementary to, to one another. Um, so planning is crucial uh, to reduce the impacts of climate change, as Youssef was mentioning in relation to national adaptation plans and adaptation communications. And we need early action and climate risk to be integrated right across investments, policies and plans. So fundamentally, we want to significantly improve disaster preparedness. Um, each year, climate related disasters are estimated to cost the global economy $520 billion. Um, and this has the ability to push 26 million people into poverty. So anticipatory ex ante, like disaster risk reduction measures can really help to minimize averts and address loss and damage to save lives and to reduce damages. The risk informed early action partnership was one initiative in which was launched at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. This has the collective aim to make 1 billion people safer from climate risk and disasters by 2025. And this is done through kind of expanded early action financing, improved early warning systems, and better capacity to act on the risks they identify. So the UK is committed 80 million to, to REAP, 
We're also working with the donor community to push the G7 and other donors to invest in REAP and other anticipatory measures, such as risk insurance. Um, so ensure resilience is another key initiative. And this is vital to bring together humanitarian climates and development spheres together to respond early and to ensure that finance is provided ahead of disaster to save lives and avoid damages. The second part of the plan pillar is in relation to adaptation planning. And as presidency, we really want to see national adaptation plans come forward, as well as adaptation communications. And these are critical, really, for a country to integrate and mainstream climate risk across all that they do. So we're working with parties to encourage them to come forward with ACOMs in particular um, by COP26. And as Yusuf mentioned, adaptation communications are really valuable in informing the global stock take in 2023, but also in efforts to progress on the global goal. So the UK produced its first adaptation communication in December. This highlights domestic progress to date in England and across devolved administrations. It speaks to how we're utilizing kind of UK climate projections, investing in nature to reduce vulnerability to flooding, but also work overseas to support the most vulnerable, um, including indigenous peoples and women and girls. But also fundamentally, it speaks to kind of barriers and constraints and it's the areas in which we really need to advance and work more on. And this is really what we're encouraging other countries to come forward with as well, is to be very open in terms of the barriers and constraints in which they have. So at the regional climate weeks with technical partners, we'll be convening some workshops on good practice adaptation communications. This will support kind of South to South knowledge exchange as well as South to North to really try and overcome local and national barriers. On the ACT, track the act pillar we're really wanting to mobilize and catalyze a step change on kind of adaptation and how it's done so really central to this is the adaptation action coalition this targets state action with the race to resilience its non-state actor counterpart which looks at business investors cities and civil society the adaptation action coalition is really trying to build political ambition and momentum building on the call for action at the un climate action summit in 2019 to make kind of tangible um, differences on the ground by way of kind of action on water, health and infrastructure work streams ahead of COP26. So we're really wanting to take political commitments, which has already been secured by way of 121 countries signing that call for action to really deliver real world action and implementation. So we're encouraging all states to, to join this coalition. Um, at the Petersburg Climate Dialogues in the coming weeks, we'll be launching the water and health work streams. There will also be a focus on locally led adaptation principles as well um, before COP26. The Adaptation Action Coalition works alongside the Adaptation Research Alliance. Um, and this is bringing together research funders and action funders to kind of coordinate adaptation research. Um, but it's got a focus really on user centric and action orientated work. So to help identify knowledge gaps and research priorities across different uh, specific sectors and supporting really innovative examples of how adaptation action can be scaled up. So the ARA feeds into the Adaptation Action Coalition and alongside the Race to Resilience, there'll be a collective work which is bringing together states, non-state actors and research funders uh, to respond to known knowledge gaps um, and to implement and deliver kind of scaled up and accelerated adaptation action. On the race to resi resilience, um, this has the collective aim to build the resilience of 4 billion people um, around the world who are vulnerable to climate risk by 2030. So 20 initiatives have recently joined the race to resilience. This covers urban, rural and coastal activities um, and it works with local communities and those most vulnerable fundamentally. On the finance side, um, this is the, the final track. Um, we know that we need to increase the quantum, improve the quality and increase access to finance fundamentally. Um, so we're working with donors, development banks and private investors to really get adaptation finance flowing faster and stronger, particularly to developing countries. So last month we hosted a climate and development ministerial. This brought together ministers, multilateral and regional development banks and the UN to look at further solutions on adaptation, climate finance, and particularly kind of fiscal and debt. And as part of our G7 presidency, we're really urging donors to significantly increase their international climate finance commitments to ensure that there is a balance 
between adaptation and mitigation. Um, and we're honoring our commitments to ensure that we meet that 100 billion a year goal for international climate finance, and also bringing forward collective conversations on the post-2025 goal um, at COP26. Um, also in relation to kind of private financing, we'll be looking at the coalition on climate resilient investments. And this is really having a shift in kind of private sector investments to ensure that we're supporting resilient infrastructure fundamentally to support the most vulnerable and attract more resilient investments from a private sector approach. And then on the access elements in particular, as mentioned before, we'll be taking forward the principles for locally led adaptation. And this is fundamentally around a shift change in how adaptation is done to ensure that finance flows are going to the local level, but also that we're working with kind of beneficiaries to design, plan, design and implement adaptation projects. Um, so this is a work stream and part of the narrative and we really want to, to convey at COP is that we want adaptation to be done differently, working with those most vulnerable, working at a local level um, to ensure that the planning, design and implementation is, is done differently um, in response to community needs. And then the final slide, please. And so this is a slide which many of you may have seen in relation to the Climate and Development Ministerial. Um, it's our roadmap to COP26 now, so I won't go through any of these events in great detail. Clearly, we're on the eve of an important event with the US uh, Climate Summit, which will be held tomorrow. We'll then be shaping up to um, the G7 process, uh, which is the kind of summit in Cornwall um, in June. And then we have opportunities looking at Chogham in particular, so the Commonwealth Summit, which will bring together ministers, and then up to UNGA, so the UN General Assembly in September, to really push forward things in relation to the plan, act, and finance tracks in which I spoke to earlier. Thank you. Liam, thank you. That was, uh, that was again, really good. Um, I think hearing how everything is starting to, to, to fit together um, is, it, it's, it's really useful. Um, it struck me as an observer that there were so many fragmented actions, um, but now I'm, I think I'm starting to see how they join. Um, it's really good also, I think, to see the, um, the focus on local adaptation. Uh, and and uh, how you're thinking about that, both in terms of funding uh, and also other sort of practical steps. That's really uh, a perspective, I think, that's relevant to this program. Um, next up, uh, we have Louise Ellis. Uh, she's going to take a, a slightly more local um, perspective um, and bring us back to um, what it means in individual cities and uh, on the campus at Leeds, I think. Yeah, thank you, Jason, and, and thank you, Liam and Yosef, for that that really nice tee up um, in terms of the the wider context of, of adaptation and resilience. So, yeah, what I'm going to talk about today is is what this means um, to an organisation like a university um, and and the University of Leeds in particular, uh, and and talk about how we as an institution consider those high level um, activities that Yosef and, and Liam have been talking about and what that means on the ground for us. So just to, to before I start talking about the detail of where we're going with our resilience and adaptation program, I, it's just important to note that both our climate mitigation and adaptation approach is grounded in our wider commitment to sustainability and an equitable future. So it, it's really nice to hear Liam, you, you're talking about those kind of, you know, the more how to reach disenfranchised groups. And, you know, we're looking at that on a, on a on a local and a global scale actually to see how what our response to climate does in that respect and to make sure that we we challenge those inequalities that that exist through our response and don't you know don't make them worse through some unintended consequences so th that's our starting point um and we we are living in a world where we know we have a locked in um climate change so we we know that whatever we do now we are going to be looking at um, a climate that is in, in a Leeds context, um, having high, hotter, drier summers, um, wetter, warmer winters, and an increase in the, the number of extreme weather events that we will have to deal with. So as an organization, we, we have to look at that. And we try and understand what that means to us in four different ways. One is around our operational continuity. Um, that also includes what's our operating costs and ways of working and what the impact of, of, of climate change will have on that. 
The other is the resilience of our university community. Um, and that's a, a very big community of staff and students. And that's also looking at that at the local and global level. So our community, particularly at the moment, is located across the globe. Um, so we can't just consider what that means in a, in a, in a local context um, geographically. It's also about the resilience of our city and the region in which we are located and, that, and a key player in that. And what's the impact on, on the local environment and local livelihoods from climate and what's our role in, in helping build that resilience. And then finally, it's the role we play in creating knowledge and solutions for adaptation and resilience. So as a university, that's knowledge is our currency. So it's important that we, we don't disconnect our operational response from our knowledge um, creation response. Um, and I'll come on to talk about how we do that on a very localized level in the hope that we can um, scale that up through cities and uh, um, across the globe. I think, again, before I come on to talk about what we're doing from an operational continuity perspective, it's important that we, we consider why we're doing this beyond that. It, you know, it's really important that actually we are resilient to the, the, the locked in climate change because if we're not actually we'll just make it worse and there'll be a negative feedback loop in terms of our, our carbon emissions will increase because we will have more heating, we'll have more cooling. So there is a really important kind of feedback loop there that we, we do have to break at a, a very, very local institutional level because actually that's where the impacts will happen. Um, and as I said, it's, a, it's really important that we look at this in terms of livelihoods beyond, beyond our own in, um, immediate community. So just a little bit of Leeds context. I know that there's quite a few um, University of Leeds um, staff and students on the call, but also for those of you that are not, are not um, more um, closely linked to the university, we have a very mixed estate. So we have um, buildings that are over 100 years old and buildings that are, well, one building that's never had anybody in because it's been finished during the COVID period. Um, so we, we have a lot of different types of, of um, building controls and, and local environments that are very sensitive to the, to the local climate conditions. Um, we're already seeing the impact of that. Um, we are our main campus is situated on top of a hill, so we have a, a big role to play in terms of the flooding of our of our immediate neighbours um, in the city. Um, but we also have quite a lot of green space land in terms of agricultural land, but also sports um, sports locations as, as well. So we've got a varied estate that we need to think about in terms of the operations and the impact of climate. Um, we are already seeing the impact of this on our, our local environment um, and our biodiversity. So in 2019, we lost actually quite a significant amount of newly planted trees and mature trees due to, to climate change. So we're seeing that happen now. Um, and what we're doing there is, is building in resilience to you know, how our, our grounds, grounds are now um, designed. Um, and we do have um, a real impact on the livelihoods of, of the people around us. So it's important that as a business, we, we continue to operate and make sure that the, the role we play in the local economy is, is um, reflected in that. Um, so what are we doing? I, our approach here is kind of, I guess, twofold. One is around what we're doing in terms of our planning, our decision making um, and our kind of knowledge capacity internally. And the other is around the physical infrastructure um, and, and how we can improve that to, to ensure that we are resilient going forward. So in terms of decision making, we are um, looking at and have made good progress in ensuring that sustainability more widely, but climate is part of the decisions that we make um, moving forward. So that's both our investment decisions. Um, it's in terms of what we include in our curriculum and also around our kind of research portfolio. Um, at a more kind of localized, localized level, it's about the plans and procedures that are in place in terms of the way that we operate. So our ground staffs now have procedures that are much more climate resilient. We're looking at how this links with our uh, construction design procedures. Um, so it's making sure that actually it becomes a reality, um, literally on the ground with the, the university community that are, are making those changes. Climate um, impact, both in terms of mitigation and resilience, is now part of our institutional risk register. So it is monitored alongside um, other key risks, including financial risk by our 
our governing body, which is our university council. Um, and as I say, we've also got local policies in place to ensure that, you, you know, when we make decisions, climate isn't a, an afterthought, it's actually driving through what, what designs we put in place. We're just about to announce our, um, our climate plan, which basically brings alive the, the seven principles by which we work in terms of the response to climate crisis. Uh, and resilience is absolutely part of that alongside our mitigation measures and moving towards net zero by 2030. And what we're doing at the moment is we've got a lot of work actually still to understand what the real implications are. And we, we, you know, we, we're very honest that we don't know all the answers in this space yet. So we're working a lot to look at actually what do we need to respond to in terms of locked in climate change and extreme weather. We're making sure that our long-term plans have resilience alongside our net zero um, planning and pathway. We're looking at enhancing and embracing nature on campus to ensure that you, we get the most benefits in terms of climate impact, but also realizing the social and biodiversity benefits of this. So it's important that we don't just boil it down to a single issue. Um, we're also looking at taking into account and supporting our university community in terms of the impact on mental health and well-being of, of climate change. Because um, I think it's really important that we don't forget that it's the resilience of people as well as the resilience of, of our estate um, and ensuring that we have built that into, into how we support our university community. Um, we're also using our living lab approach where we link our research and, and education activities with operations to build on the ground solutions which are scalable. Um, one example of this is we have a, a, a cycle track um, which is just on the outskirts of, of the city and we are working with the environment agency to develop new natural fudge management projects there. Um, which is including a lot of, of, of tree and different um, fauna and um, flora planting that is being monitored um, and being kind of played around with from a, a research perspective. Um, the importance of that is one, we are more resilient because we're not going to flood so much because of the planting. Two, we're getting real time learning from it. Um, and three, it means that it, we, it's a much less risk. It's a much riskier approach to business planning. We don't have to always have the return on investment of the resilience measures that we would in the past, because actually it's about the strategic aim of research and, and knowledge capacity, as well as just the fundamental resilience um, um, activity. We're also considering um, water use. So water will be for us moving forward actually both a mitigation and a resilience issue. Um, Yorkshire is renowned for being wet, but actually we, it's not as wet as you think. So actually we need to make, to make sure that our design, on, we need to mitigate our water use because actually it's going to become a resilience issue um, quite quickly. And then broader than that, it's looking at what our role is as a key anchor institution in the city and the region. So making sure that anything we do doesn't create, you know, environmental damage downstream. Um, as I say, we are on a hill, so we have to look at flood management system beyond our initial boundaries. Also making sure that we play our role in building the knowledge and capacity of the city and the region. So um, using our living lab projects, connecting policymakers with the world-class researchers that we have here so we can you know, see that realized within the city. Um, we're looking at designing differently and using um, those um, construction ideas both on campus but in other city areas as well linking with our, our anchor partners um, so I think there's a lot happening there in terms of both the infrastructure of the university but also the community of the university and I think my one I guess take a message and reflection on what resilience means is that we we have to remember that it's about the people in the system as well as the infrastructure as well. And to do that, actually, we do have to work collaboratively and we've got to make sure that we join like we are to today, the scales of local, you know, through national, through through global. Um, so I hope that was useful. Um, Jason, I can pass back to you now um, for, for any questions that you have for us as a panel. Thanks, Louise. Um, that was really informative. I, I think seeing practical examples of how how the response to climate change is being embedded in so many different parts of um, the, the university's thinking 
is really quite useful. So seeing it appear in the curriculum, um, into investment decisions, into managing the estate and the risk register, um, feels like it's 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 an example um, that we can probably draw on 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 larger scales as well. Um, I'm going to go into the questions that people have been submitting. So um, if we can uh, ask the speakers to all put their cameras on, I'll try and do the same if the bandwidth holds. Um, the first question we've got is from Louise. She asks, what do you see as the barriers, political will, lack of understanding or, or something else, to seeing high uptake and quality national adaptation plans? Who wants to go first? Um, Liam, do you want to take that one first? Uh, and then Youssef and then Louise. Happy to come in first. I'm, I'm sure Youssef has, has comments there of his own. Um, thank you, Louise, for the question. Um, I, I mean, I think knowledge and capacity gaps um, in relation to kind of assessing climate risks, first off, is, is the, the kind of key fundamental here. Um, so in regards to kind of climate information services and climate projections, this still isn't particularly widespread. Not every country has their own kind of UK climate projections of 2018, in which Jason Loker knows well, of which we would like that everyone to, to, to have the same degree of climate projections, but they don't, they don't exist necessarily in that scale. And then there's the assessments of those risks. So even if you had the kind of climate projections, how do you interpret that information and kind of use that and apply it in a way which is helpful for national plans? So I think there is a, a capacity related gap in relation to that. Um, there is also, yeah, that knowledge gap in relation. But I think there's also something broader than this as well. And it speaks to the points in which we do hear from many uh, countries and many climate vulnerable countries in particular, that national adaptation plans remain underfunded or unfunded in many cases. And so, so one thing which we are attempting to do that I didn't touch on in my presentation um, is in relation to an access task force, which was launched at the Climate and Development Ministerial is taking national adaptation plans that have been published um, and looking at their investment pipeline to pick up different kind of projects activities that could be funded to make a kickstart to leverage other donors to kind of come on board to kind of finance NAPs and actually ensure that it moves beyond planning fundamentally into delivery and implementation and I think they're encouraged if that is a process which kind of kicks off, which um, multilateral climate funds could get involved on, that would encourage kind of countries to, to invest. And it is an considerable investment, but to invest in national adaptation plans per se. Thanks, Liam. Uh, Youssef, do you want to talk on this concept of, of barriers as well from your perspective? Yes, I totally agree with Liam on, uh, on, on both counts in terms of capacity and, uh, and resources. Maybe a more mundane um, factor to, to bring in is time, uh, because um, um, the support modalities for the formulation of NAP started very late, many, many years after the decision was adopted to do so. And then the way it's set up is that countries are given up to three years to complete the NAP in, in the sort of the, the project guidelines of the Green Climate Fund if they want to avail of the maximum amount, which is 3 million. And most countries will want to, to, to take the three years to do the NAP. So when we're trying to accelerate this and talking to the countries, this came up as, uh, as an issue because um, it had implications on funding. And um, I think that the really interesting thing about funding implementation afterwards is that we have a relative um, fragmentation of, uh, of sources of funds. And I think a lot of countries are confused how to optimize funding. I mean, not everything uh, needs to come from uh, the financial mechanism of the convention. It, uh, some things can be budgeted through the national budget. Some things can be done through other sources. And that mechanism for optimization is not there. I mean, I, there was an excellent project I think, by, by Oxford Policy Management at, at a point in time that looked at six countries in Asia and how to do uh, budgeting for climate change. That set a very good seed on guiding countries on what is most appropriate for what type of, of activity. So we need to, to look at this type of thing, perhaps an implementation strategy phase between the formulation phase and the actual implementation phase to, to help countries put in place a holistic plan for support, also considering that the, the financial mechanism typically needs co-financing for, for some of these activities. And so, so these are, are what I think are, are the barriers to, to moving faster. Thank you. 
Louise, do you want to add anything from a, a sort of a local perspective on barriers? I think just kind of reflecting slightly, as I say, from a, a local perspective, I think building on Yosef's point about time, I think it's a combination of the time and capacity, but also that actually adaptation is still seen as a second cousin to mitigation, particularly at the moment. So actually, if there is a, a time and capacity issue, it's in a way it's easier not to do it because it is not seen as important. Um, and I also think there is there is an issue of kind of inequalities that are, that are playing out. The, the, the adaptation does play on a lot of the inequalities that exist in the systems and therefore it is harder actually to, to kind of drive some of that forward. Thank you. Okay, the next question is one that, that there's been some interesting discussion in the chat on. Um, and we could actually spend at least an entire seminar on, on this one. So I'm going to ask for uh, a very quick response now, and we can always follow up via, um, via email on this one. But Victoria asks, what exactly is the difference between adaptation and resilience? Who'd like to take that one? Perhaps you, Steph, you could have a first go at that one. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> I mean, the, the skeptical answer is it's whatever you want it to be. But um, uh, I mean, scientifically from the IPCC, adaptation is adjustment to actual or expected climate uh, change and its effects, and it moderates harm and exploits beneficial opportunities, whereas resilience is your ability to absorb disturbances while retaining the basic structure. So, I mean, in crude terms, adaptation in the beginning was just about changing in order to uh, to become more compatible with new circumstances, whereas resilience was bouncing back. But definitions are evolving in, in, in ways that actually converge and that we're always looking at now back bouncing forward. So um, uh, when we try to, um, to advise on, on, um, on adaptation and resilience, not, not just in terms of definitions, but actual operationalizing these terms, it's about looking at where, not just what, what's happening to you due to climate change, but where you want to be 10 years from now. So not just to return to today's levels of development or prosperity or whatever. But if your country in 10 years is going to be more dependent on agriculture, then you're actually more vulnerable than you think you are now. So um, adapting to today's world is different, but building adaptive capacity, building resilience to a future point which is not really what's captured in the, the, the official definitions of both terms is, I think, more appropriate. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go on to the next question so we can fit um, a, a, a few more in before we finish. Um, so the next one's from Helen. Um, how much do you think the concept of social norms and the bandwagon effect are important here, uh, particularly in terms of barriers to action? Is this a significant barrier? And how do we overcome this to reach a point of critical mass um, and do that quickly? Um, Liam, do you want to take this one? It's a great question. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, so, so I'm going to perhaps just go back to what Youssef was mentioning kind of earlier. And I mean, I think the important piece here on adaptation is that it has increased in profile. Um, it's certainly been discussed far broader um, than kind of certain kind of governments. There's a lot of action which is kind of happening, I think, from a kind of non-state actor perspective. But what we lack on the adaptation space is that clear defined goal, which we now have on mitigation. It's very clear what everyone needs to do on mitigation by way of reducing emissions. There isn't this global goal on adaptation because it's place specific, because it's context specific. And um, different metrics and indicators will be used in different situations. So there isn't that kind of global unifying effect okay, of, of focusing minds on one, one collective kind of vision. But I think visioning is really important from a kind of local perspective, a national one, and then a global one. And I mean, maybe that's not prescriptive enough um, at this moment in time, and we'd like something a bit more defined. But I think it's really important to have visions per se, which are owned and endorsed at a kind of local level, um, but then provide a bit of a direction of where we want to go to. And so I think the bandwagon effect really is achieved by kind of coalescing collectively around kind of formulating kind of visions of where we want to be. Thanks, Liam. Um I think we'll take one more, but um, this is probably one for all of the speakers. And I'm going to make it slightly more broader. Um, so Abigail is asking, 
um, what can we learn um, from the histories and experiences um, of women in the last great energy transition? Um, what does history matter for you and your teams in thinking about how to deliver these campaigns for the future? Um, I'm going to expand that so we consider all aspects. So diversity is one, um, but there are so many other lessons, I think, from, from transitions. Uh, I'm going to start with Louise on this one, then go to Liam and then finish with Youssef. So, yeah, great question and, and absolutely it's vital to look back at, at history in, in forward planning. And we do that a lot, both in terms of the history of, of the university and its campus, but also the city and, and other voices. And what we're working on at the moment is actually how do we building non-conventional kind of history? So building in storytelling so we understand actually the impact that that climate has had on, on individuals in the past and, and moving forward and what impact that has had on organizations like ours. Um, and that's that's a really key part of the, the planning process that I think we need to make sure we, we engage with. Um, and we specifically do that around um, looking at natural environments and looking at what our environment used to look like in terms of its biodiversity um, um, corridors, looking at how we can marry the fact we're an urban campus versus you know um, needing for planting and actually we've done a lot of, of looking back and and seeing the impact of that um through kind of historical archives for example um and i think we're kind of looking forward in terms of voices to make sure that that gender and other um kind of underrepresented groups and, and voices are heard moving forward thanks liam Thanks for the question, Abigail. Um, I, I mean, I think your, your question really speaks to the fact that looking back when humanity has faced adversity and there is no greater adversity than kind of climate change and the risks in which it all poses to us that we've kind of overcome it um, in various different ways. So I think there's an awful lot about innovation here, ingenuity, and also kind of collectivism of, of how people have responded. So, I mean, I guess my, my answer is what can we learn is is how we've overcome kind of previous challenges um, previously and the kind of collectivism that we really need to, to put into kind of climate change to deliver the outcomes which are essential. Thanks, Liam. And Youssef. Um, thank you. And now I agree this is a, a very good question. Um, the history of paradigm shifts provide us with a lot of lessons here. Um, sometimes the paradigm shifted because of trauma, big wars, sometimes because of massive technological um, shifts. And I think in the next 10 years, we are um, undergoing a type of techno uh, economic paradigm shift due to AI, big data, uh, satellite technology, uh, biotechnology changes that require us to look into the past as to how previous paradigm shifts have happened. Because certain assumptions today about um, about values, about economics, about politics may be totally invalid a few years um, from now. And, and it's, it's really good to look at how we can capitalize on the opportunities given by these changes, both in order to fix equity problems as well as fix our relationship with nature. I mean, there's tons of really great um, ongoing initiatives that nobody hears about that if replicated would, would solve a lot of our current problems, ecological problems, and we need to bring those to the fore. We need to look at also social norms and behavioral change at the same time um, uh, in, in, in understanding how um, people's behaviors can evolve because we do need that shift in, in worldview and in actions to follow that and in legislation to follow the two. And so these are, are things where history gives us a lot of guidance on how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've reached one o'clock. Um, I'd like to thank again the speakers, um, virtual clap. Um, I know the rest of the audience is also doing that, but they're on, they're on mute. Um, there's a few more questions. We'll try and follow up with those um, offline and get answers that you can find on the, on the website. Um, and then finally, thinking ahead, um, the next seminar is on the 5th of May. Uh, Peter Hunter will be looking at um, uh, impacts on water quality through Earth observation. Uh, and then on the 19th of May, we'll be looking at surface water flood now casting, uh, both really important topics. So thank you, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>